Speedy readers, and welcome to another chapter, or well, chapter in terms of uh, Speedy Read chapters, of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So, it's the same crack as before, I've got 15 minutes and then I've got to be out of here, so let's read as much as we can in 15 minutes. And where did we get up to? We got up to, oh, mark the page, mark the page, where did we get up to? It was chapter two, The Vanishing Boy. Ah, sorry, The Vanishing Glass. All right, I've got it here. Starting from now, 15 minutes of speedy reading. Here we go. Yet, Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice which made the first noise of the day. Up, get up, now! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up, she screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the cooker. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorbike in it. He had a funny feeling he had had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? she demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider off of one of them, he put them on. Harry was used to spiders, because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them. Mm, And that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had got a new computer that he wanted, not to mention the second television and racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favourite punch bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was, because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, back black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of sellotape, because of all the times Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead, which was shaped like a bolt of lightning. He had had it as long as he could remember, and the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had got it. In the car crash when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked, by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, Small watery, uh, small, watery blue eyes and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of eggs and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Aunt Marge's present, see? It's here under this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible, in case Dudley turned over the table. Aunt Petunia obviously scented, scented 
danger too, because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents? Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have thirty... thirty... thirty-nine sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh. Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little Tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. boy, Dudley, and he ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it, while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a cine camera, a remote control aeroplane, 16 new computer games, and a video recorder. He was ripping the paper off a gold wish he was ripping the paper off a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger bars, or the cinema. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she had ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry, as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs Fig had broken his leg her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr Paws and Tufty again. We could phone Aunt, we could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly Vernon, she hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them like a slug. What about, oh, what's her name, your friend Yvonne? On holiday in Mallorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in, hopefully. He'd be able to watch what he wanted on TV for a change, and maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd just swallowed a lemon, and came back. Oh, sorry. And come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia, slowly, and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Now Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he really cried, but he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Duddy Dums, don't cry. Mummy won't let him spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to... To come, Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always sp spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Piers Polkis, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Piers and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the very first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they'd left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Auntie Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers, look, looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald, except for his fringe, which she had left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and sellotaped glasses. Next morning, however, he had got up to find his hair exactly as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. He had been given a week in the cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. 
Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old jumper of Dudley's, which was brown with orange bubbles. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a glove puppet, but certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash to his great relief. Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd got into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual, when, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he'd tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big bins outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Piers to be spending the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs Fig's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favourite subjects. This morning, it was motorbikes. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said as a motorbike overtook them. I had a dream about a motorbike, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beetroot with a moustache. Motorbikes don't fly! Dudley and Piers snickered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. There was one thing that the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions. It was his talking about anything acting in a way that it shouldn't. No matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon. They seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Piers large chocolate ice creams at the entrance and then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, uh, they bought him a cheap lemon ice lolly. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratching its head and looking remarkably like Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little way apart from the Dursleys so that Dudley and Piers, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favourite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory wasn't big enough, Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt, afterwards, that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in here, with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Piers wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a dustbin. But at the moment, it didn't look in the mood. In fact, he was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though. He wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. 
Where do you come from, anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa Constrictor, Brazil. Oh, was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again, and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil? As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mr Dursley! Come and look at this snake! You won't believe what it's doing! Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Piers and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Ha oh, that's it. 15 minutes speedy reading, and we're going to have to leave it there and see what happens to uh, Harry. Dudley and all of that lot of the zoo. So, I'm enjoying this. I hope you are too. I'll see you soon for another speedy read instalment of J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. But as for me, I'm out of here. All right? Bye.